Baptist Church. We're so delighted that you've joined us today to make our home your home for this time of worship for the coming week. We're people gathering together on a common journey. You can see our vision is discovering Christ together. And when we're on this journey together, we're discovering it takes quite a bit of trust. Trust in one another, trust in the way that we're going, and trust in our God together. Trust. It's so important and we're discovering that in new and various ways as we're working ourselves through this pandemic. You know, according to a 2015 story that was published in the Washington Post, those who are millennials in American society don't trust you. They don't trust me. As a matter of fact, they have very little trust in any of us. According to the latest polling out of Harvard University's Institute of Politics, they really don't trust anyone not government, not the Supreme Court, and definitely not the media. Society-wide trusts and institutions is at near record lows, the report states. The reason for this trust, this distrust, has been predicted that it's because this safety net has gone. Ever since 9-11 took place, this idea of being safe and secure within society has rapidly diminished. Safety and security, they're so significant for you and I if we're going to be able to work through life together in this sense of trust and having trust, having confidence in the direction that we're going together. You know, everywhere we look, trust is being examined and re-examined, whether it has to deal with politicians, whether it has to deal with banks. And if 9-11 had such a devastating impact on the way we predict, on the way that we move in and amongst in one another in society, what effect is COVID-19 going to have on you and I as we take a look at this important aspect of trust? So this morning, we're going to take a look at trust. We're going to take a look at trust as it becomes highlighted for us in the third chapter of the book of Ruth. You know, the psalmist says to us, Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart is glad in him, because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. As we come to God in worship, let us pray, shall we? Holy Spirit, teach us to trust in your direction. Help us to have confidence in your guidance and direction. Use this hour, we pray, to turn our lives into a powerful demonstration of what trust in our God looks like, of what it looks like when we trust in one another on this common journey. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.
It's great to praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. this morning comes from Ruth chapter 3 and takes place for the large part in a threshing floor. Now a threshing floor was a place where all the harvested crop was taken and laid down on the floor. And so if you can visualize most of the plant, that is the stalk that was cut off close to the ground, the stalk up towards the kernels of grain or the kernel at the very top. And so there, whether it be wheat or barley, would be taken and laid down on the ground. And it was there that the crop would be threshed. And that threshing took place by the means of a tool called a flail. We've talked about this before. And a flail was basically two pieces of wood, sort of resembling two by twos, maybe in the area of three feet long. And at the end of one of the sections of wood, in the end would be fastened a small length of chain. And that chain length would then be fastened to one of the ends on the second piece of wood. And so if you can visualize a farmer using this flail, bringing it back up over his head, and the second piece being allowed, of course, to bend and flex where the chain was, and as he brought it down upon the stalks, the, the piece of wood would go flat and beat upon the stalks. And this process of threshing was designed in such a way to separate the kernels at the top from the stalk. So there'd be kernels wrapped in a husk, that were attached to the stock, and the idea was to separate that grain. And when that had all been done, then a process of winnowing would take place, where a crude instrument resembling something of a pitchfork would be used to dig into the pile, throw some of it up in the air, and as the wind came across the threshing floor, it would blow away the chaff, and so the grain heads would fall down right onto the threshing floor. And so that's what a threshing floor is all about, and that's what takes place 
there. The second piece of interesting background that's necessary for this passage is the idea of a kinsman redeemer. And it's referred to here in verse 9 of our text, and so you can listen for that. It's either a guardian redeemer or a kinsman redeemer. And this was another measure God had put in place to protect those who needed protection, widows. And so if a widow, whether she be on the younger side or a little bit older, just recently lost her husband, there was a provision in which a family member could step in and fulfill the role as husband. And when they did that, the first child from this new marriage was actually be considered to be the child of the deceased husband. That way, the family line could continue. And so there's this idea of a kinsman redeemer that becomes an important part of this story of Ruth as she makes her way to Bethlehem with Naomi. Again, it's one of the ways that God had provided for those, the least of those, who were part of the promised land. So let's hear the story. Today I will be reading from Ruth 3, verses 1 to 18. One day Ruth's mother-in-law Naomi said to her, My daughter, I must find a home for you, where you will be well provided for. Now Boaz, with whose women you have, been, have worked, is a relative of ours. Tonight he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash, put on perfume, and get dressed in your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know that you are there until he is finished eating and drinking. And when he lies down, note the place that he is lying. Then go over and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do, I will do whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking, and he was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man. He turned, and there was a woman laying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are my a guardian redeemer. Of our family. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All the people of my town know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am a guardian redeemer of our family, there is another who is more closely related than I. Stay here for the night, and in the morning, if he wants to do his duty as your guardian redeemer, good. Let him redeem you. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, No one must know that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, Bring me your shawl you are wearing, and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and placed that bundle on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she told her everything Boaz had done for her and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then Naomi said, Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. As we settle into 2021, news streams continue to communicate concerns about the ongoing global health crisis. Often, these messages adversely affect the audience's perspective by relentlessly repeating negative messages. Consequently, they evoke more anxiety and fear and raise questions rather than provide answers. The prevailing question, when will we return to normal? Consensus suggests that yesterday's normal no longer exists. We need to embrace a new normal yet to be realized. This is how my devotional read for this past week. And I thought, how appropriate. What an appropriate message as we're moving through what I'm hoping is the latter half of this 
pandemic, or at least the last half of this pandemic. You know, I would have thought these words would have also been on the hearts and minds of Ruth and Naomi as they made their way now from Moab to, to Bethlehem and found themselves now trying to find a way to make a living. And we know the story how Ruth has now been involved gleaning in the fields of Boaz. And that's been enough to sustain them in the midst of their poverty. But let's be clear about this. They are poor. They're the poorest of the poor. And it's only by God's provision in the law through this gleaning that they are being looked after. Certainly Naomi, but Ruth as well, would need to be asking themselves, when are things going to get back to normal? Well, we find in this passage today that Ruth in particular now is not looking for things to get back to normal, but very much looking at things to move towards a new normal, a new normal, a new normal that's going to be established by trust. That Ruth sees that trust is the way forward. You know, truth be told, trust has always been the only way forward. It just gets highlighted in times of suffering, in times of difficulty, in times of stress. Trust, it's a big deal. Trust, you shouldn't leave home without it. As a matter of fact, trust, you shouldn't even get out of bed without it. Trust. So this morning we're going to take a look at this five-letter word, this five-letter word that we're finding here in Ruth chapter 3. Trust. Do I give it? Do I get it? And do I have it? Do I give it? Do I get it? Do I have it? Let's look at trust. First of all, do I give it? Do I give trust? Now, it's a very straightforward question. Is trust a gift that you and I give to others? Are you and I the kind of people who engender trust, who people automatically look at us and say, I trust you. I find you to be trustworthy. Do we engender trust? Do people just simply trust us? Do people look at you and I and say, you know, you're a safe place for me. You're a safe person for me. I can put my life in your hands. As a matter of fact, that's a good question. If you take a look around the people who are closest to you, who would you say, I can put my life in his hands or her hands? Trust them. They engender trust. Essentially, People who have good hearts can be trusted. And we saw that last week as we took a look at Boaz and how Boaz lived this life, this good life. He had good character. He was a good person. But he wasn't good just because he did good things. He was good because he was chasing after the very character of God. There was a goodness that emanated deep within Boaz because he was a God-man. He was a seeker of God. His life was built upon this character, the very character of God. Ruth has also seemed to develop a similar kind of trust in Naomi. It's a trust that's built over time. It's a trust that's been built on relationship. First of all, through her husband when they were in Moab and then then got to know Naomi as her mother-in-law. But after her husband then died, learned more about the relationship firsthand with Naomi. And then, of course, a lot more to learn as they traveled now for Naomi anyway, back to Bethlehem and started this new life together where Ruth had pledged herself to be with Naomi, to be at her side, for her people to be, for that is Naomi's people to be her people, and for Naomi's God to be her God. It's a lot of trust is being built up here. And so in the third chapter, we begin to see that this sense of trust that Ruth has in Naomi extends that beyond which anyone has any right to trust someone. Trust beyond the boundaries of what might be seem to be apparently a good idea. And so we find here in this chapter is that Ruth is now intent to turn from what Na- from what Ruth has been able to accomplish so far. So Naomi is now seeking to turn what Ruth has been able to accomplish so far in gleaning in the fields and a sense of favoritism before Boaz into something far more permanent. 
Naomi has now set out to be matchmaker. And she's looking to set up Ruth with Boaz. And so her aim is clear, that Ruth would have a godly husband, that Ruth now would have a secure future, and that Ruth now would be able to preserve the family line. She says in verse 2 that Boaz is a kinsman, and that sets us up for this idea of a kinsman redeemer that we talked about earlier. And so therefore, Ruth sees Boaz as being the best candidate for this kinsman redeemer, that together they'll be able to follow the law, the letter of the law, and Ruth will be able to secure all these things that Naomi wants for her. And so this is what she tells Ruth to do. She says, Ruth, go clean yourself up real nice. Use the scented oils and the water in the bath. Dress yourself very attractively. And then later on this evening, go to the threshing floor where Boaz has been working during the day. And after he's retired for the evening, flaked out on straw or flaked out of perhaps the leftover stalks from the harvest from the field and resting, sneak in, lift up the corner of his cloak and lay down at his feet. Now, if you're thinking that this sounds like something that would come more to the pages of a Harlequin romance novel, you'd be right. This is every bit as risque as it would sound then as it would sound right now. It's not clear at all why Naomi would suggest this, why Naomi would go about it in this way, in this fashion. Why would she suggest something like this, this kind of after-sunset affair, rendezvous type of approach? But Ruth trusts Naomi. She trusts that Naomi knows what she's doing and what she's trying to accomplish. Ruth trusted Naomi that this was somehow going to work out very differently than the way it had appeared. This plan will never take place if there isn't trust. Ruth's trust in Naomi. You know, there are things that God longs to do in us, for us, and through us that simply require this kind of trust. You know, I cannot share with you, and you cannot confide in me, and you and I will not accept the wise counsel of a third party unless we what? Unless we trust. Unless we trust that they have our best interests at heart. And so it's a challenge for us to look at someone and trust them and be able to open up what they are saying to us and explore it and see where God is at work in the midst of that. Am I a trust builder? Are you a trust builder? Do the people who are around you trust you? Trust you? Do I give trust? Secondly, do I get trust? Do I get it? To get trust is to really understand how trust works. To get trust is to see the actions of others around us through the lens of trust. There are times when trust, trust is earned, and there are times when truth, excuse me, when trust has to be extended beyond its normal boundaries. Sometimes beyond boundaries that even make sense. Trust beyond what makes ordinary sense to us. Just so we don't get caught up in there being some kind of social custom that would suggest that what, what Naomi has told Ruth is really some sort of um, courting or mating ritual, because it isn't. This has been totally made up out of Ruth's mind. It's not there in the social custom of the day. And we can see this very clearly because when Naomi comes, excuse me, when Ruth comes to Boaz and does as Ruth has said, Boaz doesn't really understand right off the bat what's going on and what's taking place. And bring it up against the fact that Naomi has told Ruth that once she does his first part, uncovers his feet and lays down and lays down at his feet, that Boaz will know what to do. But it's not Boaz who knows what to do as we read the text. It's Ruth. It's Ruth 
who's able to think quickly on her feet. It's Ruth who says what needs to be done. It's Ruth who comes up with the next stage in the plan. You see, this has been something that's been done all on the basis of trust. And we begin to see here that God is honoring this process as crazy as it is because the intent is clear. The intent is pure. The purpose is holy. And the purpose is in keeping with God's covenant with his people. So as this plan unfolds, it's Ruth who has to tell Boaz what's going to come next. So what then takes place is based on trust. Trust that's been extended by Boaz to Ruth. It's a trust that was first based on a relationship with Naomi that's now been extended to Boaz in a circumstance where Ruth has been now making herself extremely vulnerable. Ruth trusts Naomi. Ruth now comes before Boaz and makes herself very vulnerable, very open. I guess in the very worst case scenario, Ruth could be physically taken advantage of, either sexually or physically abused. Not likely, given what we know about Boaz's character, but there's always that question mark. What's going to take place here? Ruth could, Ruth could also be deeply hurt. She could be totally rejected. She could be laughed at, laughed off the threshing room floor. Boaz extends great trust to Ruth. Even though she's put herself in a compromising position, he recognizes what she's doing. He recognizes. And he looks at, he looks at Ruth through this lens of trust. He sees her actions, no matter how a little bit off they seem to be, as being trustworthy. And that becomes clear when the whole idea of kinsman redeemer is approached. He now sees this is what Ruth is doing. Ruth is making herself totally and fully and completely available to him as a marriage prospect. And we can see that when Boaz in turn says, the Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than that which you showed earlier. Earlier, referring to the kindness that she showed to her mother and the way she's conducted herself in the fields. And then he says, you have not run after younger men, whether they be rich or poor, that she has come to him and looking to him to be her kinsman, redeemer. And so Ruth's actions are seen through this lens of trust. Trust is more than giving someone the benefit of the doubt. Trust confers special benefit with no doubt, right? Looking at her through this lens of trust. This is what I know about Ruth. I trust her. I see her actions. And I see now this is what her actions mean. I trust her. Do we look at one another through the lens of trust? Regardless of what people might do from time to time, say, so easy to misinterpret people these days on email or texting, other forms of social media. But do we say, I know this person, I trust them, I look at them through a lens of trust and just purely on what I'm able to read here in the text in front of me. So do we get trust? Do we get it? Do we look at others through this lens of trust? Lastly, do I have trust? Do I have it? The person of Ruth plays a critical role, not only continuing the family line of Elimelech through Boaz as the kinsman redeemer, that is, Boaz now will be looking as the one to stand in place of Elimelech's deceased son. But Ruth also figures prominently in the genealogy that moves us from Abraham towards King David. We've talked about this several times already, that Ruth is the great-grandmother of King David. But Ruth, in being part of that genealogical line, is also part of the line that will lead from David all the way through to the birth of Jesus the Christ. And so Ruth plays this critical role. And so there's no question why this book would be included in the scriptures. 
She plays this important role. She comes to it as a foreigner, as a worshiper of pagan gods. And she comes and then agrees to follow the God of the people of Israel, to follow Naomi's God, and to follow him with faithfulness. And God trusts her. God places enormous trust in her. A plan that he's working out in the short time to move towards King David, but also in the long term, that's going to result in the redemption of the entire world. Ruth's part of that. God trusts Ruth. God also trusts Boaz. He trusts Boaz, and again, this godly character, this goodness that's deep within Boaz, he trusts Boaz, that he's going to look at this situation and look at it through a lens of trust and is going to simply be able to say, I know there is a right way to do this and there's a wrong way. Boaz could have easily jumped and tried to fulfill his own masculine desires, if you want to say that, his manly desires, or his own wants or wishes to just to hold on and keep Ruth for himself. He recognizes right away that in God's provision, in God's way, there's a process that must be followed and that there was actually someone in the line to be kinsman redeemer before him. Boaz continues to follow out God's ways in dealing with Ruth. And so there's God's trust in Ruth, God's trust in her growth and her maturity as a follower of his now, of a new convert to Judaism, and God's trust in Boaz. And so while the evening on the threshing room floor could have gone horribly wrong in any number of ways, Boaz and Ruth carry themselves out in godly character. God trusts them to fulfill these huge responsibilities leading to the birth of King David. If we look at our relationship with God, this passage begs us to ask ourselves the same questions. Ask ourselves this, with what does God trust me? Do I have God's trust? Ever ask yourself that question? We talk a lot about our trust in God, but do we see our relationship with God when it comes to trust as reciprocal? That God, I look to you and I trust you. And God, I also recognize that you look at me and you trust me. And to what does God trust us with? You know, this trust all began when God sent the Son of God into the world in the person of Jesus, the Christ, and trusted him to be obedient to be obedient to the point of death on a cross so that you and I might be restored in our relationship with God. That you and I then, in being restored in that relationship, are invested with the, with the commission and with the task of sharing that message with others, that God trusts you and I to proclaim that message to live out our lives in such a way that shows God's goodness and then gives us opportunity to tell of his goodness to live out our lives in such a way where we are relevant. We are relevant with our friends and our neighbors. God trusts you and I to be relevant, to be able to proclaim in new ways to fresh ears that God loves them, cares for them, has sent Christ into the world so that they might have a relationship with him. God trusts you and me. Is that how we see ourselves? And that kind of reciprocal relationship with God when it comes to this five-letter word, trust. You see, you and I are not so broken. You and I are not so weighted down in sin that God cannot trust us. Is that a, isn't that something? <laughs> when I think about that in my own life, that I am not so broken. Do you think about that in your life? That you are not so broken. That God is not prepared to trust you and I, with a life-giving message. He trusts us. He trusts us to be able to defend the hope that we have, to defend that hope, as First Peter says, with gentleness and respect. He trusts us. And so in this passage today from Ruth chapter 3, we can ask ourselves these questions. Do I give trust? Do others trust me? Do I get trust? 
Do I see others through this lens of trust? And do I have trust? Do I see that God is trusting me every day to be the person he's called me to be and to do the things he's called me to do? Lord, is it true that you are trusting me? That you are trusting us? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks again. Thanks for joining us for our time of worship here today. We trust that you have found God's spirit working within your life as you share in our singing and the reading and the, and the expounding of God's word. I also hope that each week you are receiving our weekly update. It comes out every week on Friday, and then you'll find all kinds of prayer requests and events and activities in the life of the church. If you're not receiving that, please contact Christina in our church office, peoplematter at whitbybaptist.ca, to get put on the list. So thank you very much for joining us. Keep reading God's Word. 
Keep praying, keep studying, as we look forward to coming back together, we hope, a lot sooner than later. Take care, and God bless.